Well, as we study this morning in the book of Mark, chapter 14, open up your Bibles and then let's kind of a review what we studied this morning. We are going to look at a, a different view now before we go to the second part, which is going to be a kind of see what happened in these passages and what are the characteristics that Peter was connected with and what was the steps that Peter took towards apostasizing against Jesus. So the steps that he took to apostasize. Why was that? Because Jesus instructed Peter. Jesus was the master. Jesus was the one who taught Peter. Peter witnessed the power of Jesus. Peter witnessed all the miracles. Peter was there, walked with him, and he knows everything. He said himself on the book of Mark 16, verse 12, when he said that you are the Son of God, he said. You are the Messiah, the Son of God. So, we look at that, and Peter was facing a challenge that the night, Jesus says, that was written that tonight all they are going to be offended because of me. And then he says, no, Peter says, well, you, you got this wrong. Maybe they are. Maybe all of them, but not me. So we got Peter in a different, uh, in a different position. Per Peter is taking a position that is not, is going to give in or showing signs of weaknesses towards who? The rest of them. So he says, even though they are going to be denying you for me, no. You're wrong, Jesus. And this, you are wrong towards me. I will die for you. So we are going to look at about five steps that it took to apostatize all the way through. And then from there, we're going to look at about Peter. So let's look at a step number one located in, in the verse that we read it early. Let me go back and do the Bible to get it all the way to the top so we can follow together what he did, what was the first step that he took to apostasize. You read that in the book of Mark 14, 27. In the book of Mark 14, 27, it says, Jesus said unto them, All of you will be offended. All of you will be offended. Why? Because of what? Huh? I mean, all of you they will be offended. But what was the first step that, G that Peter took is towards apostasy and apostasy against Jesus? What was the first step? He was, the first step that he took was pride. He was so full of pride. That's the first step you take to apostasize. In other words, I know it. And I, who do you think you are to tell me what to do, what is right, what is wrong? I know it. So the first step is a person to apostasize against what his belief is to be pride. Ego. Proudness in the men's house, that's a, that's a no no. That's the first step Peter took to apostasy and to go again and start going to what I call backsliding towards what the teaching that he was taught by who? By Jesus. So the first step he took that, the first step he took was to be pride, to be proud of himself. Not to admit that he was a weak in the area because he was facing a kind of a, a critical moment because he was in front of the rest of the disciples. 
So everyone was, every one of them was fighting for a position to be next to God. So Peter is not going to show any sign of weaknesses in front of others. So he wants to be arrogant, proud. Pride took place of them. And consequently, that was the first step to apostatize against his Lord and maker. So why would the Bible tell us about that? When you read in the book of Proverbs chapter 16 in this matter what the Bible says. And again, to cover the whole point that I'm trying to make you about pride, arrogance, and the ego. You can read it from 27 of Mark 14, 27, 29, 30, and 31. That's give you the whole picture. Okay, to get the whole picture about of of this passage. And then in, in Proverbs 16, 8, it says, Pride goes before what? Destru destruction, right? Isn't it, isn't it how the Bible says that? Before what? Destruction. What does destruction mean then? Huh? Like a demolition, isn't it? Knocked down. Pride, it says in Proverbs, pride goes before destruction and, it says what else? Hate the spirit before a fall. So Peter took the first step towards apostasy against his Lord and Savior. So let's look at that. So like I said, five points before going to the look at uh, the part Two, this is I'm kind of a going to, for those that were not here early this morning, for the presentation, to get the glimpse of what we talk about it. But in the same way, I uncover to you more deeply, and when we read it this morning, I did not give you those details. So five points in there, they are besides what I presented to the message this morning. But before we continue, I just wanted to tell you that it's going to be five points, and then for that we're going to get to the part two. We are going to be looking at Peter Assuming that he was with God, walking with God, he was under the impression that God was inside with him. That's why he acted the way he acted. So, God is not going to be inside someone who's proud, arrogant. God is not going to be there. So, before we begin, let's, let's have a word of prayer while I kneel together. Precious, lovely, heavenly Father, as we know, Lord, that all of us, we must reach a level of qualities that will reflect your son Jesus. Not the world, not the ideas, the education, the system of this world, but the purity of the, of the gospel, the purity of the message, and the purity of the character of Jesus to be able to be developed among each one of us. Help us, Lord, that we understand how we can picture this most important part of the gospel. If Jesus is not in us, we have no way to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Lord, we pray that you will assist us in our study this evening. In the most precious name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. Amen. So, so we are looking then at the first step that he took. We're looking about the passages in Proverbs. And, and in Matthew, to cover this point too as well, in Matthew 18 verse 3 says, And it said, Surely I said unto you, unless you are converted and become a, like a little children, you will, will what? Will by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. Oh, so here is the passage that no one with an ego, with arrogant attitude, would enter into the kingdom of heaven. I don't care how you want to look or justify your behavior, you're not going to be entering into the kingdom of heaven. So, 
This is the first part that Peter took. Because he took himself to stand up with an arrogant attitude. What happened? He just ignored the warnings of God. The prophecy that Jesus prophesied to Peter. He said, Peter, tonight you are going to deny me. So because he was so proud of himself, in other words, plain English, a big head of himself. He wanted to take nothing. That he's inferior to the rest of the disciples. And in fact, even challenged Jesus to say, no, Lord, I will die for you. So, let's look at about then point number two to carry on. Like I said, what we covered this morning, we're going to uh, try to illustrate it. And point number two is located in the, in the same chapter, all of them in the same chapter, on verse 32. What do we see in verse 32 happen there? Now, if a person feels proud and arrogant, they don't need to study. They don't need to be wary. They don't need to be looking into all passages of the scriptures or looking at, a, uh, being, in other words, disciplined to study, being themselves working through the word of God because they're so proud and so arrogant, so sure of themselves. What do they do? Sleep, isn't it? Become lazy, isn't it? Now I'm more active. Active in what? In God's word. In the gospel. So because of that, Peter took the second step of apostatizing. He's no longer anymore active in the spirit. He's no longer working for the Lord. He's no longer connected with God in communion and relationship, having devotionals, having to study daily with God. So he become, what do you, how they find him when he came? Then they came into the place which was what? Name was? Gethsemane. And how when Jesus went in to pray, when he come back, find them doing what? Ah, laziness. Laziness. That is a step number two to become towards apostasy. We don't study the spirit of prophecy. We don't study nothing. We wanted to fit a spoon fit by whoever. Huh? But when somebody comes to you as an early, as an early comer, you are being 20 plus years in the, conference, in, in, in the Adventist message, and somebody comes only five years and said, you're going to tell me how to read the Bible, how to understand? you only been five years. I'm 25. I'm a second generation Adventist. You're going to tell me? That's the attitude. That's the attitude. And this is what happened here. Jesus told Peter, and Peter says, well, I'll be ready after my nap. That's what he's saying. Isn't that what he's saying in here? I'll be ready after my nap. I know it's going to happen. I'll be ready after my nap. So that's what Peter says. So this is all the steps that took, okay? And I'm going to, like I said, I'll give you some scriptures. You read it, and I'm going to continue on because the point I wanted to get it to the second part because of time, and I wanted to make sure we cover that part. Now, this is the Peter He's not converted. This is the Peter He's not connected with God. This is the Peter that Jesus is not inside of Peter. The only thing that he has for the Lord, what did I say this morning? Big mouth. That's about it. That's about it. But he's under the impression, assuming that Jesus is inside. Because I, let's put it this way. Then he walked with Jesus. He did everything together with Jesus. So, because... He never stopped and to look at himself. He never, he never stopped to do that. So therefore, he never find out in the early stage that the only thing that he has for God that was a big mouth, not the heart, not the mind for the Lord. A lot of us, we can be in the same position, friends. We know that the persecution is coming. We know that the decrees that are coming, the enforcement of different decrees is going to be take place. But you know what? That is not going to save you. That is not going to get you ready. But having Jesus in your heart, mind, and soul, you'll be ready. You'll be ready. And Paul, Paul teach about that. We're going to look it into some, some passages. Yes, it's important for us to be healthy because a healthy body functions what? Huh? And a healthy mind, what? See things better. 
In other words, Satan wants you and I to lose our sensibility for holy things. We're not able to distinguish the clear word of God, the voice of God. So polluted mind, contaminated body, we're not going to be able to function right. We're not going to be able to think right, to process things right. So Peter this time is doing that. He's not aiming for his spiritual growth. It's only allowing the body, the mind, to be controlled by the flesh and not by the Spirit of God. So uh, consequently, if you become lazy, you can read also the way down from verse uh, 34 down into 30, uh, 38. So I'll watch all the way to 41. Yes, true. We'll, we'll read it into all that. If what is the Bible says on, on Luke? We could read it early. Luke 21, verse 34. But take heed unto yourself, unless you what? Take heed unto yourselves. Unless the things that's going to come, the worries of this world, they're going to take you overwhelmed. Your heart is going to be over. Overloaded with it. You're not going to be ready. Because when you read verse 35 and 36, he says you need to make sure you are going to be among the, those are the ones that are going to be account to be worthy to be in the presence of God Almighty in the end of judgment. But he says the only way to do is by fasting and prayer. Tells you there. Now, what Peter is doing? That he's fasting and praying? What he's doing? He's sleeping. But his mind is ready. And his mind is ready to take whatever challenges is coming, isn't it? Didn't a lot of us, we do that? I say, I know I have a lot of, lot of things to do tomorrow. I'm going to take a nap and think about it later. Right? We know that. We know that. A lot of people sometimes, they are very tired. They get us getting into a car. They start driving. And they don't even go maybe an hour or two and we start getting, you know, there's more dangers to do that than to, you know what, pull over, rest properly, and then start fresh. You, give, you do more witness for the Lord that way. You do more honor and glory to God by doing that than to act like a, we act like a fool sometimes because we not follow the right protocols of the health laws of God. So, here we are again that the passage will tell you and in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard, lest we drift, what? Away. Away. Peter is not giving heed for the message. Peter has now become lazy. So he took again the second step to apostatize against God. So he's going to take a step number three. By now, probably you're proud. You, what's going to happen? And you are proud. You are lazy. And the step number three, what do you think is going to be a step number three? Look at it. The Bible tells you. Uh, in fact, a step three and four is right there in the same verse. On, let me look at it to you. Uh, let's look at it. This is the same chapter in uh, Mark 14. Let's read on verse 54. What does in 54 tell you there? What the third step that he took? Uh, let's, let's, let's read it. You know, and then you can see the key in there. It says, but Peter follow him is what? Is far off. So what did the next third step that he took? What is it? No. No. Okay, I'm going to put it in plain, simple English, okay? You're a very strong man. I'm a very weak man. And you challenge me in a fight. A I become a coward. So, cowardness in this place. She is a Peter now, become a coward. Again, proudness of himself, not preparing for the things that are coming up that Jesus told him. He become lazy. And the third one, when the situation's in front you engage or the situation, the situation is in front of you 
If you're not prepared for it, you will do what? You start running, isn't it? Peter has now become a coward. Peter become, took the third step towards apostasy. Now have no position, no relationship with God, no communion with the Lord. They have no discipline in this life. So, consequently, he become coward. Is that going to be affecting us? Yes, indeed. We can become cowards ourselves, too. So, Peter now is taking the step. The step number four. Step number three, I'm sorry. Let's go to the step number four. In those passages, you can read that to back it up. Of uh, the book of Mark uh, 8, 38. And Revelation 21, 8. He says, no cowards will enter into the kingdom of heaven. So think about it. If you are going to retrieve or not face anything in the name of the Lord, the Lord says, there's no coward will enter into the kingdom of heaven. It tells you there in the passage in Revelation. Revelation. So, it's step number four in the same passage of Mark 54. What else do you see Peter is doing? Mixing himself? Huh? That's right. He doesn't identify himself, become a coward. He blends in, so he doesn't take a position for the Lord. He doesn't want nothing to do to be identified. Therefore, he says, no, I don't know this man. I don't even know the gospel that he's preaching up. I don't know what he's talking about. I am with you. That's what he's saying. So he went and he blends with the world. So, worldliness is where it took place. Step number four. If you don't take position seriously into your life, for the faith and the convictions that you have in your heart, you become blended with the world. You have no position for the Lord. This is what happened to Peter. No. If he already took number four, it's going to be the, the final step he's going to take. And who's reading it this morning, but I did not cover it to you this way. Let's look at... And to back it up, this passage that I'm telling you, you can read them in Proverbs 6, 27 to 29. Proverbs, 20, uh, Proverbs 6, I'm sorry. 27 through 29, what I was saying. And 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Now let's look at about a step number, number 5. Now, and seventy and, and verse seventy one, uh, seventy to seventy one and seventy two, this woman, the servant of the, of the high priest, he went around and he says, "Yes, you are. You are one of them because you speech. I agree. You look like them. You talk like them. You are one of them." And then he did the final. When he confronted them very clearly, yes, you are. One of the Jesus. The final step is denial. It's how the apostasy will take you. He denied his master. Because you're going to be to a point in your life. They're going to question your beliefs. What position are you taking? In Christianity. And now Peter is facing that. What the mingle with the world. The, the people in the world. Now is questioning him and asking, yes, you are. You are like them because you speak. Let me say this to you. If I continue coming, I'm a people in the, in the world. I, I have no denomination or religion, right? And I start coming to a Sabbath church keeping church. And I start coming in. And my neighbors beginning to start seeing me that every Sabbath I'm leaving all dressed up. And leaving. Why? And maybe one of those days, they follow me. And they said, you a Sabbath keeper. Because we saw you in the church. And there's something that you connect you with them. Because on Saturday, you get up early, dressed up, and you are going. And we saw you going, and there you are one of them. And I'm going to say, no, I am not. Sometimes, friends... We do something unconscious because if the more we are walking with God, 
And the more we do things according to the gospel, we don't even realize we become more reflecting the gospel and the love of Jesus Christ within our lives. And Peter, they don't realize that. Even though he was have no connection with God, because he has something to make him distinguish that he and thee has something to do with the Messiah. He connected, but he rejected. He refused to be identified with the Messiah. Therefore, he says, I don't know this man. I don't even know what you're talking about. Leave me alone and start what? Cursing and swearing. This is what's going to happen, friends, in your life. Now, this is the part, the image of Peter, when he was under the impression that Jesus was inside of him. But it was Jesus inside of Peter at this time. You think he's going to be cursing? Huh? Swearing? No, friends. Now, in your life and my life, every time we get out of line, who is inside of us then? Is that Jesus? No, friends. It's not Jesus. Every time we look different to our sister or our brother and differences, you think it's Jesus there? Every, every time I, I, I raise my voice to a brother, because the Bible says you must learn to love who? Your enemies. Every time I raise my voice to a person who come aggressively towards me, even an innocent, I, I'm an innocent, I don't know what you're talking about. And I respond defensively. I said, what are you talking about? Oh, you got me wrong. I had nothing to do with this affair. And I start cursing or raising my voice and kind of defending myself. Is that really the spirit of God? No. So just think about it. There are qualities, criteria that really re reveal who is inside in your heart and in your mind and in your soul. At this time, Peter was under the impression he was wrong. He saw it. And it was never Jesus was inside. The only thing that he has for the Lord is a big mouth, and that's about it. But the heart, no. The soul, no. His thinking, no. Everything was somewhere else, but never with Jesus. He walked with Jesus. He walked. He talked. He spent time. He witnessed. And yet, never was a relationship with God. Because there was what's a relationship with God, God will come in and take over inside, and Peter will be a different man. But you can see. So what does that mean to be? It doesn't matter whether it's 20 or 40 years in the Adventist message. If you are not aiming for that conversion to have a full, to surrender yourself to God, to let God have full control of your life, you will never be a person who developed Jesus within ourselves. We need to allow that to take place. You need to be willing to say, Lord, whatever that I have that is blocking me or is not allowing you to come in in a full control of my life, take it. I rebuke it, Lord, in thy name because I want you and me. Because if you and I we together, we can conquer the enemy of the souls and we can be ready, Lord, to be with you and spend the rest of our life in eternity with him. But if it's not there, we continue to have wrong habits, wrong uh, lifestyles, our own cravings that they know they're not good for us, and so many little details. We don't need to make all those, all those little remarks or, or uh, name it, but one, the Lord knows that. If you're not willing to say, Lord, here they are. I don't want it no more. You don't do that. When the crisis will come in front of you, you're going to be like Peter. You're going to be like Peter. Because Christ is not full in control of your soul, mind, and body. He's not going to be. He's not going to be. And Jesus is not going to take, make a home in a body that is polluted, contaminated, is not prepared for him to be a dwelling place. But... Let's look about Peter now. Let's look about Peter. Peter, at this point, went to the route. You realize it. But he went to the, to the most hard road any man can take. 
to really. Like a kind of a way of putting his own foot in his own mouth. Here's what happened. This big mouth they have for Jesus, you, know, you have to swallow everything that he said and be humiliated in front of everybody. They were so proud of themselves. And you know what? Because of that, the Lord said, Peter, I love you. I love you. And I have no doubt in my mind, Peter, at under, under that particular moment, he was not even sure about himself. The way he react, he was, a, he was under the impression that Jesus was inside. And I've been with the master. I spent time with him. He talked to me. He is part of my life. No. The actions reveal who is in control of your mind and in your life. And Peter showed he never. He never was under the control of Jesus himself in this life. Friends, and after we look at about Peter, now we're going into the book of John, what we read it early this morning, that what John was, wrote that, and then it was Jesus appears to the disciples. This is the third time that he appears to the disciples. And when he appeared, the third time with his disciples, something miraculous happened in there. Remember we read it this morning. Remember we read it in John? When he rec recognized that Jesus can read the minds, but Peter it was not is going to allow anybody to tell them what to do, even Jesus himself. But when we read on 21 of the book of John, we'll read on verse 15, 16, but just particularly on 17, when he says unto death, he said unto him the third time, Simon... Son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And Peter was, again, kind of a shock. It was kind of a passing for that particular moment of really still remember what the Lord revealed to him. What revealed to him is just, because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thy knowest all things. You know, Lord. You know all things. I know now. I was a fool. How many of us were really, we took this step, a humble, a humble view of your life and my life, and to say, Lord, I do not want to be any more a fool. I want to be thy son and thy daughter. I don't want to be a fool anymore, Lord, to bring shame into your name. You suffer enough in my behalf. And Peter now saying, I know that you know it all. And now I know that you know my position that I'm taking now for you, Lord. And the Lord says, I know. Go and feed my sheep. You have the bread of life. The bread that I am, the bread of life, Jesus says, you have it. I am in you and you are in me now, Peter. Go and teach them. Teach them all things do you know now. Baptize them and make disciples of all of them. And remember, Peter, I am with you always. He told them. He said, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. So let's look at our... After Peter, now, Stephen was murdered, 34 after Christ, and Peter was preaching into 63 to 69 after Christ. So it was 30 years later, he continued preaching. And he wrote about what he wrote to tell you and me the foolish things that he did and how that we know when we have Christ in us how to respond it and how to engage the situation. And this is Peter now, his writings, inspired by the Holy Spirit. First one, what is the opposite of uh, uh, proudness? Huh? Humility, isn't it? Look at what Peter wrote in here. Let's, let's go into it and let's read it about 
Look at it one by one. See, this is the thing, brothers, like I said, we are, need to know, we are going to know from now on who is in us. If God is in us, we are going to respond differently. Not anymore. Like Saul's. Verse 8, and it says, on 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because you adversary the devil is what? Running Lying is just walking about seeking whom he may what? Devour. Hmm? This is Peter now saying. What does that word serve mean? Obedience. Discipline. We always do that. Not anymore. This is Peter. He's writing now saying. Now, why is he telling that? Because Christ is in him now. Before he cannot say that. He cannot. This is First Peter chapter 5. Hmm? Verse 8. And let's read. And you can read it. They continue. You can read it in verse 9. You can read that in verse 9. But I wanted to give you that. Um, and the reaction. The way his recommendation now. Now is what he's saying. On point number one. That he took. Of apostasy. He repented. They apostatize against Jesus. He confessed it to God. Brothers and sisters, the only cure for apostasy is to repent and confess it and turn around towards God and not to the world no more. That's what he says here. Paul realized, Peter realized that. Paul realized that too. He turned around. Now is step number two. What was the step number two they took to apostasy? Laziness, right? Was sleeping. Now read it. Now Peter wrote now, and it says on chapter, on First Peter chapter, uh, let me see. Let's see. Let's read uh, another one. Let's read um, Second Peter. Second Peter. Second Peter of laziness. But let's go into the Second Peter of two one ten. But let's go into the humble about humility. Because he was so proud. Let's go to a step number one. I just skipped that one. Let's go to a step number one on First Peter 5, 5. 5, 5 says, Likewise, you younger, mind, he says, yourselves unto what? Unto elders. Yield to all of you what? Subjects. One into what? Into another. And be what? Go with, with what? Humility. For God resists the proud and give grace into what? Into humble. This is Peter now saying, remember young, youngsters, uh, respect you other ones. Respect who has higher authority than you. Is what Peter said in it. Because God, God is going to what? Discipline those proud people. And he says, but God is going to give grace to who? To the humble ones. So Peter received what? Grace. Because he humbled himself by confessing and repent what he done for God. And God gave him grace. That's why Jesus said, the grace is what? Sufficient? Ah, Peter now has it. This is the step, step number one. And in verse number 6, uh, in the same chapter about Peter, now says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in what? In due time. Now it's no longer, it says, it's not about you. It's about God. If you're going to be in this race, you're going to be in this battle, it's not about you battle, it's about God's battle. Self has to be crucified, is what he says in here. And do the battle for the Lord. Now let's go then with step number two, what I said, laziness. We'll just read it that one and that one diligent. Uh, be sober. We'll just read that one, right? He says, be sober on 5 8. He says, uh, be sober, be vigilant, because you ever said the devil. We'll just read that one. Let's go into 2 Peter 1 10. Says wherefore, 
The rather what? Brother, brothers, give diligence, it gets to what? To make you calling and what? Election. Sure for what? For if ye do these things, he shall never what? Fall. He fall because he's not taking position for God. But now he said, if you take the position for God sincerely in a disciplined manner, you will never fall. You will never fall, Peter says. And believe me, brothers, he says, I went through it, Peter says. I went through it. I went through it. Now let's look about this, the third point, coward, cowardice. First Peter, chapter 416. Let's read it. First Peter, chapter 416. It's just Peter writing, advising us. It says, yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in his what? In this behalf. This is Peter now talking. This is Peter of a cowardice. Point number three is what he says. Repeat that again. What it says, 16, 1 Peter 4. Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, in other words, as a convert one, sincere one, it says that you suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God and on this behalf. Peter took that. And that's why Jesus said unto him, go and feed my sheep. You have it. You understood now what was my mission, my purpose. Now that you are in me and I am in you, go and do thy will. Do what you've been told. Now cowardice, I mean cowardice is not longer an issue with Peter. Now he's willing to stand. Did he stand up for Jesus in times of trials and tribulation after this? Yes. So what did it take for you, for you and I to succeed trials and tribulation? A sincere repentance, a sincere confession, and go back no more. And one more thing. Conversion into our souls to be able to conquer the devil. When God is in you, the devil has no chance. The devil has no chance. When God is don't have a full control of our lives, then the devil has a chance. He knows because the devil has been watching your life, my life. He's been in this world longer than you and I. He knows where your habits, your weak spots. He knows what buttons to push on you. But the Lord says that I have where you need to overcome the enemy of the souls. And Jesus says, if you allow me, you'll be a conqueror in my name. As I am, as I was here in this earth. I conquer him because my father and I, we are one. And my will is not mine, it was my father's will. If you allow me, you and I can be together. You will will be mine. And then together, we will defeat the conqueror, the conqueror of this world. You and I, we can, will defeat all this. And I promise you that what I am, you will be also in my father's house. We need to keep that in mind. But Peter had to go through all that. Now Peter is able to write all this because he allowed his master, his Lord, now to take possession of his life. Yes, he went the, the, he went the, the hard way, the, the difficult time in his life. But he allowed that. Now let's think about point number four. Worldliness. 1 Peter 2.11. 1 Peter 2.11. And it says, 1 Peter 2.11. Let's 
Let's read First uh, Peter 2.11 to understand these passages. 11, it reads this way. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, uh, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. 12, having you conversations honest among the Gentiles, that where they speak against you as what? Evildoers. They may be what? By you good works, which they, which they says shall behold, glorify God in the days of visitation. You see? He said, Peter, don't mingle with the world. Don't mingle with the unbelievers. Don't mix with them, is what he says in here. Take your position for the Lord. No low you standards. No low you standards. Because if you glorify die, God in the day of visitation, which is the end of time, I tell you this, this way you will be end up in the kingdom of heaven with God. He says that no mingle with the world. No low you standards. Before Peter doesn't want to identify in f in four, he mingled, isn't it? He was there. Causing with the fire, getting warm, forget about Jesus, forget about everything. He just want to mix in there, not be identified. But now says, wait a minute. God's people have to take position. And I'm telling you, I went the wrong way. Take position. It's worth it. Because God is going to give the whole kingdom for those who take the position in this earth in his name. Take it. Now the final step that he took. Point number five. This is Peter now. He denied his master. Point number five, the answer that Peter in this. This is all the answers of Peter after his conversion. Okay? Point number five. He denied the master, but now he encouraged us. He gave us his counsels to now how to overcome it. Let's go in first Peter chapter three, verse fifteen. Fifteen it says, But Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you. And what? In reason of the what? Of the hope that there is in you. With what? With meekness and fear. With love and kindness and respect for God, he says. Not deny the master. Not deny the master, he says. Not. Now, in concludes to this, let's read one more passage. That is in Second Peter chapter three, verse seventeen and eighteen. Seventeen and eighteen it says, "He therefore, beloved, seeing." He know that the things before more or less he also be what? Being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own uh, stuffness. Now, brothers and sisters, in 18, but grow in grace and in what? In the knowledge of our Lord. And Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory. Now and forever. This is Peter saying. This is Peter. Now. To close I'd like to take you two passages. That I wanted to summarize what Peter understood that. The apostle Paul understood that. Now Peter says. It's the only way. It's the only way. And in Romans chapter 3, let me see, let me give you two passages so we can close this up. One is in Romans chapter 8. This is the Apostle Paul, right? This. Romans chapter 8. Let's go there quickly. Romans chapter 8. And let's read on verse 8, 18.
that lives in me and the life which I now live and the flesh I live by the fate of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I say this. Peter conquered because he humbled himself. He acknowledged that the step that he took to apostasy against Jesus is going to destroy him. It was no hope. It was no hope. So the cure for apostasy was confess, repent, and don't do that no more. And Peter took that position. He overcame it and he wrote that. Listen, all of you, what I took before knowing my Lord, that was me. It was not reflect nothing of God. I want you to get clear. There was I was in, I was I before. And what we don't have Christ into our lives, we take the same position as Peter before this conversion. We need to invite God to be in your life and my life. To be able to conquer and overcome your defects, your problems, and to become victorious. You and I, but the Lord says, my son, my daughter, I came here to show you the way. But I'm not going to force you to follow me. It has to be a free will. You have to willingly say, Lord, you are worthy. You are worth more than all this. I will voluntarily, willingly give myself, deny self, give myself willingly. It's the same way you give yourself on the cross. Second of all, the Lord says, remember, it's going to be a responsibility. Not somebody's responsibility you own. Get the cross that belongs to you as I took the cross for all of you and carry it for me. And it says, and then willingly, after you have it, then take the steps towards me and walk with me. And I promise you that everything in the other end is yours. Is yours. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? What we need to do, friends, let this ego come out. Let this self come out. Let all the things that is not allowing your life and my life to become like Jesus. To become in control by him. And I, this is an illustration that I said when, when I was in, and I present this, that I was in, um, I was in Europe. Because it was, Europe is a very secular world, nation. They are very uh, cold towards the Bible. But there was a few there, and thank God, because of that, not me, the Holy Spirit. Now they are faithful people coming to the church. And I said to them, because they're very materialistic people. And I, in America, the same way, I want you to know that. You do a crusade, and here in America, the very few come. Because they said, hey, I have a car. I have a home. I have a job. I don't need that. I don't need that. But you go to the two world countries, they have nothing, and you hear a message of hope. They come by the bunch. They say, I want to know about this Jesus. I want to know about this life. I do want it. I do want it. And here, not now. And in Europe, the same way. And I said to them, listen, you have a car. And I wanted to close this up. I said, you have a car, isn't it? And what the car does, what the car does, what I told him to do, okay? The car is in the garage. It's going nowhere unless you... Physically take your, car, your keys out of your car, right, for your car. You physically get into the car. You physically put a key in the ignition and it turn it, right? And then you know where you are willing, you are planning to go, right? And then you take the car. And you get there, right? So it's physical involvement. But it also it takes planning, right, where you know where you want to go. And the, the car is there to assist you. And I said, let's look at it this way. The keys represent your life. Huh? Represent your life. The car represents you. And the one who's going to take you 
the direction to make you think, to process, have to be Jesus in your life. That's how we're going to work it, this way. Physically, you need to say, Lord, here are the keys of my life. I am no longer driving this car. Lord, you have the key of my life. I'm going to become, for now on, a passenger of the car. You will drive. And whatever you take me, I know, Lord, the way to heaven. There's no man in this world who knows the way to heaven. Jesus knows the way to heaven. So, say, Lord, here they are. Take me. I will not complain because as a human, we're very selfish individuals. We want to take what? The easy roads. When you see... Uh, it's nice and it's smooth and concrete way. You see those holes and, and racks. I don't want to go there. My car is too nice to go through there. I already go this way. So we're always trying to find ourselves the easy way, isn't it? But Jesus, when you give the keys to Jesus, you say, Lord, and you take me with those bumpy roads, I will not say a thing. If you take me with whatever, I know it. I have to have tolerance in my life, patience, and faith. And trust in you, Lord. And then you give it to him. Because in the end, the Lord says, here are they who have the patience of what? So who's going to be leading your life then? If you're leading your life, you end up going through destruction. But you allow Jesus. And you say, Lord, take it. I'm not driving anymore my way. You're going to be the Lord and my Savior in my life. But you need to make that decision. Do you willing to make that decision? You willing to make that decision? I'd like them to bow down and pray. Let's just, just, just kneel together and pray. Precious, lovely, heavenly Father, we are being so selfish throughout our lives, very inconsistent, and through our Christian life and our Christian walk towards you, Lord. Because we humans, we have the tendency to become of very selfish individuals. But Lord, I think at one point in a Christian life, we can say enough is enough. And it's time, f and it's time for us to sincerely deep into our heart. It says Peter realized it. And he said, there's no way to fool our God. And there's no way to hide something for the Lord. When he said in John, he said, Lord, now I know that you know everything. Lord, you know our conditions. And we ask you, Lord, to please accept us as who we are. And when we ask you, Lord, to give us a chance, that this chance will never neglect it anymore. We will never, never become lazy. We will never become assuming on things. But brother, as situations arise into our lives in front of us, but there is a situation, big or small, we will disciplinely bring it unto you, Lord, for you to give us direction, instructions. Lord, we pray for our forgiveness. But we've done many things wrong into our lives. We become like Peter, assuming in a lot of things, acting with a self inside, instead of being, what will Jesus do in my situation? Oh, Lord, we're so guilty of a lot of things. But we're so grateful that we have a God Almighty, so compassionate and so lovable and so kind. But we don't want to take any more, Father, abusing, actually, your love and your kindness towards us. It's time for us to become more, more willing, more with a heart for more gratitude. And to say, Lord, it's our time to respond the same way you, res you, you respond towards us. It's time for us to show you, Father, that we want you to be part and to be the master and the Lord of our lives. Guide us, lead us, and forgive us, Lord. As we pray, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.